Hi there everyone, I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange and thank you so much for joining us. We've got some interesting things to talk about again today. Tiger Woods apologizes to the world. We'll talk about the drowning of yet another intoxicated college student at UW Lacrosse. And we'll talk about the announcement that a company from Spain will build a plant here in the Menominee Valley. And we will talk about the push by UWM to build a basketball arena somewhere on campus. Joining us tonight, our newspaper columnist, Joel McNally. Kevin Fisher, aide Republican State Senator, Mary Lazic, and oftentimes a host over at WISN Radio. Denise Calloway, she's the Communications Director for the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. And Gerard Randall, consultant and local job creation expert. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, the first thing we'll talk about, Tiger Woods' very public apology for his marital indiscretions and for letting people down. I think it was extremely heartfelt and extremely sincere, and I think this will help his image recover very, very much. Well, I, I think so. I, I watched the whole interview, and well, it wasn't exactly an interview, but the whole speech. Stage and, event. And, and, but he, at several times during the course of the speech, uh, started to choke up, and his mom was sitting right there. Her body language, if uh, you could read it, uh, showed that she was uh, obviously feeling uh, for him as well. And to give that kind of speech knowing that it's not the end of it uh, is a very, very difficult thing to do, especially for someone who is perceived by the public to be always in control, as Tiger Woods is. Uh, certainly, once he gets over uh, his rehabilitation process uh, or the formal rehabilitation process, uh, it, the people are going to be looking for him to be back out on the links again um, uh, for some type of practice, trying to gauge which uh, tournament he's going to be uh, participating in. Uh, the attorney folk were saying they can't wait for him to get back out, obviously. So look at all of the attention that he was able to garner. He, he got more attention for this than the president of the United States typically gets for a press conference, uh, where you do get a chance to ask questions from time to time. So this is just the start, I think, of a whole process of him reintroducing himself back to the golf community as well as to the uh, uh, community that will be looking to see whether or not they should side with him again with an, an endorsement contracts. Denise, I, I read a couple of reviews this afternoon, and I was surprised at how many just ripped him and said this was absolutely insincere. It was corporate golf uh, making him do this, and he was just worried about his image. You know, I, I think that we kind of, there were two different kind of sides of this. One was his apology, which I, I do think was sincere. I think the problem is the setting in which it was staged. It was very, very staged. Again, it's back to Tiger Woods somehow controlling his image, and I think that takes the edge off the sincerity for some people. Kevin, does he owe anybody an apology anyway, <coughs> other than his wife and his family? <laughs> well, I mean, we've talked about this in the past, uh, how much privacy are you allowed but when you're the most famous athlete or, or sports figure in the world and everywhere you go there's a microphone or a camera yeah I, I think he does owe the public an apology and I'm not so sure on the sincerity meter this was real real high uh, what it took weeks and weeks and weeks for him to say I'm sorry for something he should have said I'm sorry <laughs> instantly uh, you, 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 all of us on this podium or on this stage have been to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of news conferences. Mm -hmm. You call a news conference when you have something new to reveal. I didn't see anything new here. I don't know when I'm going to come back golfing. <laughs> and, and let's face it, the man is a pig. I mean, he didn't cheat once. He cheated numerous, numerous times. I, 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 and the, for the PGA commissioner to come out today and say he's a hero... I'm sorry, in, in, in my dictionary, uh, when you turn to the page hero, uh, Tiger Woods' picture is not there. Sports fans are fickle. When he returns to the links, he will be accepted back. There will be an excitement because there always is about Tiger Woods when he golfs. And, uh, you know, the golfing links are not like the Bradley Center where you can cheer or boo or heckle. Uh, that kind of behavior won't be tolerated when Tiger Woods comes back. But I, I'm sorry. He can say I'm sorry till doomsday. Uh, I'm not going to buy it. I think a lot of people won't buy it. And I give his wife credit for not being there. How many times has the cheating boob of a husband gone in front of a microphones and he's had the, you know, the, 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 the wife standing there looking at her, 
looking at him somewhat adoringly to try to take some of the, the criticism off. I give his wife credit for not standing next to him at this phony staged event today. I, I think the other thing we have to remember is that he is being treated for sex addiction, and we can all giggle and laugh about the fact of sex addiction, addiction but... If it is like any other addiction, it, it is a serious set of circumstances that he's dealing with. And I think part of his recovery from that is making this very public apology about the fact that what he did was wrong. He may not understand because he's still in treatment the depth of, of what he did and how wrong it was, but I do think this is part of what he's going through. And I do think that if it is a true addiction, then that's one of the, the things that he has to do as part of this process, is admit that he was wrong. That's part of the recovery. And it sounded like it was written by him, <laughs> and to me it sounded honest where he was saying, I am a failed human being, I admit it, and I'm going to try to deal with it. I, yeah, I, I didn't look at it the way Kevin did at all. I actually thought it was pretty uh, pretty honest and sincere. It was staged, and it was, it was the press makes you go through a ritual. Uh, now he's not through it yet because he hasn't taken questions. And there, and, the, and that, well, well, you know, give You're him a, a give him a break. A guy stands questions. up in front of 150 million people and takes the blame for what he did. Uh, that's a hard thing to do, and I and I could I could imagine <laughs> what it would be like to be in that situation. Uh, and to me, the you know the, the emotion all through it was was real. He's he's mm -hmm. kind of a robotic speaker, and 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 obviously it was written, and and he he touched all the right bases, I think. For, for taking the blame himself, for, for trying to get the press off of his family and off, his, off of his wife, which they won't do. Uh, the next thing he does have to go through is some ugly thing where they get to, to uh, shout questions at him and, and, uh, and he has to respond to them. But I don't think that, I think the, for the public, let's face it, the guy is the greatest golfer in the world and that is what he is. It, nobody ever said that means you're the greatest father or the greatest husband or the greatest human being. But but he stood up and took the blame for everything he did. Uh, he he uh, the fact that he said, you know, I don't rule out returning to golf. You know, this year made it to me sound farther off than than I thought it would be. I thought the reason he was coming forward now was so in fact that he could he could play in the Masters, Masters. in April, uh, uh, and I, I don't think that seemed even possible today. Um, but he's got to go through some more, and and, and truthfully. There's the golf thing, there's the personal life thing, and then the other part of it is the corporate thing. Um, you know, the, what his behavior affected more than anything was corporate profits, uh, advertising revenue, uh, money he can make through advertising. And, you know, after he goes through this process, I do believe he will return to it. But I, I actually kind of admired him trying to say, you know, not just that I'm sorry, but I hope that sometime you can believe in me again and talking about how he realizes this does affect children, mm -hmm. this does affect people who looked up to him. Uh, and I, you know, I was, I was pretty moved by it. And, and yeah, it was staged. I give that. I mean, he, he, he's a millionaire who has around him public relations people who ought to be able to tell him how to do it the best possible way. But, um, you know, he still has to run this gauntlet and he's still got a few more things to run. All right, next topic. This week in La Crosse, Wisconsin, a drunk male college student drowned after apparently walking into the Mississippi River. He was the ninth in the past 13 years. His blood alcohol level was an amazing 0.28. Once again, police say adamantly there is no reason to suspect foul play, and it's disrespectful of people who bring that topic up. But I certainly understand those folks who subscribe to the theory that maybe there's a serial killer on the loose, because why isn't this happening in Madison where there are two big lakes and lots of lots of college binge drinkers. Why isn't this happening in Milwaukee where there's a giant lake and lots of rivers and lots of binge, binge drinkers? So I, I think it's a fair topic to continually discuss. Well, I, I, I agree with you that it's fair and it raises alarms any time that it happens, particularly in the cross. Uh, but let's look at what's happened over the last several years uh, when people began to pay more and more attention uh, to these drownings and, and begin to investigate them a little bit deeper than what they had with the initial drownings <clears throat> that came to, uh, uh, that came to surface. They got cameras up all over the place. They can go back to these cameras and they can tell when someone is walking along the river, who they're walking with, 
Um, if there's someone who's lurking about or standing around too long along the river's edge, uh, if their intentions seem to be uh, to uh, conduct some type of harm. Uh, so th they've got surveillance that will help not only to determine whether or not there was a crime committed, but they can be proactive in trying to prevent something from happening as well because of the monitoring. Secondarily, this is, again, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, those who drink and drink excessively and don't have companions with them to at least uh, look out for their safety uh, can lead to some very bad consequences. Uh, we try to tell young people that, whether they are uh, drinking heavily uh, in the, 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 the company of others in bars that are nowhere near any water or traffic, uh, as well as those that would probably do it in the privacy of their own home. You cannot have this type of behavior without having some severe consequences that follow with it. And, and, and that seems to be the case here. Uh, so I don't think that it was a situation where uh, this was uh, or can be attributed to a serial killer that may be out there. This was just uh, some irresponsible behavior that led to, unfortunately, a very tragic end. Kevin, is it fair for people to bring the subject of serial killing up when this happens over and over again? I, I think it's crazy. Uh, and I agree with the law enforcement in La Crosse that it is uh, insulting to the victims. Uh, the law enforcement today, and that would include law enforcement in La Crosse, pretty dark, pretty dark on good. Uh, if there was a serial killer or killers loose in that city, I think after all this time, uh, with all of the tools that law enforcement has at its disposal, they would have probably nailed who was who was doing this. Uh, I don't buy into these Oliver Stone th theories or or conspiracies. You have, a, and I, you know, I'm not going to overanalyze. You had a kid who drank far too much, three times the legal limit, who, who like others, uh, found himself in in the water, and it, it, it's very unfortunate. And you also have this culture in Wisconsin, especially with young kids, that to be cool you have to drink and drink a lot, especially on college campuses. I think beyond that, any kind of silly theories that there's some Jack the Ripper type running around lacrosse, I think that's absurd. Denise, does it does it take the the spotlight away from the fact that we should put more attention into stopping binge drinking? I think, to me, there's a mystery. The mystery to me is why the university, the police department, the city haven't done a better job of focusing on this. <clears throat> Clearly, these are young men who, are unfortunately, are intoxicated. They stumble out of the bar. And they get ready to turn home, and if you take a look at where a lot of the college housing is in Lacrosse, it's it's in the direction the of the river. Direction. They, 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 you know, they, they've they've got to be able to. They're turning in the way of thinking. They're going home, and they end up in the river. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have to take a look at how we do a better job of pointing out to young people the dangers of binge drinking. I think the college bears a responsibility for doing a better job of that. I also think that the police department needs to find ways that it can work with the college and with bar owners in that area to really impress that upon kids. Um, and finally, I think we do have to ask why the city of La Crosse has not done a better job of trying to set up some kind of barrier or something that helps to keep kids out of that river. You know, well, it, isn't La Crosse doing a good job? Why isn't this happening in Madison where there's a tremendous amount of binge drinking and they talk about it every single September? but they aren't taking bodies out of Lake Mendoza yeah. and Lake Monona. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, to tell you the truth. I don't, I don't understand why it's insulting to the victims to uh, suggest that, you know, there's some foul play here. Is it, is it, you know, less insulting to say you're just such an idiot that you, you walked into the river drunk out of your mind? I mean, uh, the, the, the fact is, I don't understand. You know, uh, the bar district here in Milwaukee is a block from the Milwaukee River. And, uh, and people aren't going into the Milwaukee River after they get, I, I, I'm sure, just as, as drunk as college kids in La Crosse can get. Probably in groups as opposed to um, these kids who have well, well, been... That's and, 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 and we, college we kids, that, college that kids that drink in year. groups we all did. the time. College kids drink in groups wherever they are. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, I don't understand 
you know, why, it, it, particularly the fact that this has happened over a number of years, it's very well known, everybody knows about it, why the college kids in that area are not so aware of it that, they, that there aren't uh, things set up, uh, you know, whether they're bus, you know, shuttle services or whatever. I mean, you know, around the UWM campus or the Marquette campus, you can get, you can call a shuttle uh, yeah. if, if you can't get home uh, or somebody can call a shuttle for you if they think you can't get home. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it just makes sense. And I, I can't understand what's so different about lacrosse compared to other colleges where there is kids just, probably just are like just, going on. Uh, you know, feel invulnerable. Not, it's not going to happen to them. Well, kids always do. Right. All right. Let's talk for just a few minutes about the announcement this week that a Spanish company that makes engines and generators for wind turbines is going to build a plant in the Menominee Valley. It'll be a $15 million dollar plant that could employ up to 275 people when it's up and running heavy duty. Is this a huge victory for Milwaukee and a nice feather in the cap of Mayor Tom Barrett, Kevin, or is this just another little company? Let me be clear here. Anytime you can bring jobs, especially in this economy, that's a good thing, okay? Uh, but I think you have to put this in perspective. It's not a great major accomplishment here. You have all the powers that be. We're all yucking it up and patting each other on the back. For this particular company, why? Because it was the kind of company that creates jobs that those dignitaries want. Well, why don't we? Why don't we roll out the red carpet for everyone? We don't. Instead, what what do we do to our Harley Davidsons? What we, what do we do to our local small businesses all around the state of Wisconsin? We make it more difficult for them to do business here. We we overregulate. We have too many rules. We have too many taxes on on small businesses and and other people that want to create jobs. So so while this was nice and it was all right, we bring in a Spanish company, and I find it interesting that it's a it's a company from Spain which more, more than any other country in the world has embraced this green jobs uh, concept. And, and since they did that in 1997, uh, they have lost jobs. They have lost 2.2 jobs for every one created, according to a, a university study in Madrid last year. They have lost a ton of money because of the rise in energy costs. So Spain has been, guess what they've been doing? They've been exporting their jobs out of the country, and that's what, we're, that's what they're doing here. But we have people like Jim Doyle and, and Tom Barrett who have taken the green job Kool-Aid and think this is going to be great. I don't think so. It's a handful of jobs when we really need to bring <laughs> jobs back to the whole state. Would, would, would people have been as excited <laughs> if it wasn't a wind turbine company but uh, a meat rendering plant? Yeah. Well, th that's a good question uh, <laughs> because both of them would probably have so much stigma attached to them as this wind turbine company has uh, attached with it. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of folk that are... Uh, jumping up and down trying to bring uh, wind power um, into Wisconsin. <clears throat> there are some companies that are attempting it, but uh, th it certainly has a lot of detractors. It doesn't address the problem on a large scale, Correct. but it gets there, and I think what, what it is, it's a good news anchor for hopefully what is uh, what will be more jobs to come. I, it, it's, it's certainly not a panacea. I don't think they ever sold it as that. Uh, but they did want to say that if they begin to work on a regional basis at trying to attract companies here <clears throat> and quit competing with one another internally, that it'll yield good results. And that was the, 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 the good news that I got out of this, that at least you've got all of these economic development arms that are now starting to work together collaboratively to bring organizations, selective companies, jobs, back here to... Selective jobs. Well, and well, this particular I, I think, company is one that you want to bring in because it wants skilled workers, which we have an abundance of here in this community. I, I think when you take a look at how the jobs came here, that's really a huge success story. We, we, we take a look at what happened. The M7 was out talking to other businesses about what we need to do to be more competitive, to bring more jobs of all kinds here, and that's when this particular situation began to develop. I think it's great news. It's great news because it's 275 jobs that potentially are going to be in this community, and you're not going to be able, we didn't lose all the jobs at once, we're not going to be able to replace them all at once. The other thing that's really key for us is take a look at what is happening in terms of this particular company. 
They want to be able to have highly skilled manufacturing jobs here at a point in time when some of us thought that that was never going to happen again in Milwaukee. It's really an important piece of beginning to rebuild the manufacturing in a new way with new opportunities, and some of those are green jobs. Finally, I think what Gerard said is absolutely right. We can't underestimate the role that the M7 played in this, not only in being cooperative, but also really having some of those big guns out talking CEO to CEO about why this is a good place to do business. You know, it's, it's not the new, it's not another Alice Chalmers, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And I thought it was very impressive that they said, we looked at 75, 80 cities and we settled on Milwaukee. Uh, this is, this partisan thing where, because Jim Doyle and Tom Barrett announced it, you got a bad mouth, jobs coming to Milwaukee. I mean, to me, that's absurd. And, and the fact that it is the kinds of jobs that will grow in the future. These are the jobs of the future, and, and if Milwaukee can get that reputation, a worldwide reputation, as a place to come, uh, that, that, you know, that is exactly where we want to be placed. Uh, that's exactly what we want people to think about us. Um, and uh, there's absolutely no downside that I can see, and, and I, it just amazes me that anyone would even, you know, come up with anything negative to say about it. <laughs> All right. Let's take just a few minutes to talk about the announcement this week that UWM is looking into the possibility of building a basketball arena somewhere on their campus at no expense, they say, to the taxpayer. Is the program there so successful that it would ever be able to support its own arena? Well, here's what they did. They went to the student body first and asked the student body if they would tax themselves $50 a year for the next 25 years to pay for this arena. The, and, and so if you start to calculate, even on a base of 10,000 students paying this fee annually for the next 25 years, you're generating enough money to at least come up with debt service on $15 million, on a $15 million project. Uh, beyond that, they'd have to get donors in, and then they're looking at program revenue. Right now, they don't get to keep any of the concession money from uh, the, the program playing down at the arena, and yet it's costing them $300,000 and up to play at the That's arena right. every year. That's and, right. And they're losing money on it. And, they're, they're and, not and, and, and it's, a, it's a money loss. So, you know, they can work the numbers out so that this makes sense, but it doesn't address the bigger problem. <laughs> what about a dedicated facility for uh, the, the practice for both the men's and women's team? Um, they can put it virtually anywhere. They can site it on campus. They could put it closer to the dormitories down near North Avenue. There are a lot of questions yet that have to be answered about this, but do they have the money? They've got a foundation for it, and I do believe that uh, it makes some sense in some ways, but I would like to see a counter from the downtown business community as to uh, what they can put in place in order to keep that program playing downtown because they got there because they didn't have enough room to meet the conference need uh, to have, um, I think it was 6, 000, uh, a 6,000-seat arena for uh, the men's team to play in. Kevin, in order, to be, in order to be popular, that program has to appeal citywide, community-wide, and can you, will UWM ever be able to do that? And, and I mean, a, they, they did under, under Pearl. Yeah, and, but, I'm a, mm -hmm. and I'm a Panther graduate and a big Ricky Franklin fan. Hey, there we go. And uh, I, I, I just don't see what you're, what you're describing. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's there. Uh, I did talk to a high-ranking UWM official a couple of days ago who told me this all blossomed out of, of all places, a story that was generated first in the UWM student newspaper, the UWM Post. Uh, who, who latched on to the angle you said about, well, the kids are willing to pony up 50 bucks a year for, for who knows how long. Uh, and then the Journal Sentinel got wind of it, and they said, well, we, well, we, we got to look into this. Um, and then it snowballed, and then you have university officials in the paper trying to uh, respond to, are you going to build a new arena, and how are you going to build it? Well, they, they're going to study it, but there, there's no definitive plans to build a right, new but arena. I, but I think it's a critical step in this whole method that UWM has been going through over the, over the past decade to change its image as a commuter campus. Um, they're doing yep. the, the dorms, they're taking a look at what they're doing in terms of building research. This, if you're going to be a university that people tend to think of on the par with the UW-Madison, you got to have your own but place. Building a new arena and will and take George, forever George here. Coons, the athletic director, is a magnet for money. And, Absolutely. And he's, he's well, you're going to need it because tax money, 
It's not going to happen. Not going to be there. All right, we have to move on. If you follow politics even a little bit, you've probably noticed a new buzzword making the rounds lately. It's something that everybody wants. It's something that every political leader suddenly needs. And Rick Horowitz is here to tell us all about it. Rick. Hello, and welcome to the National Narrative Institute. Here at the National Narrative Institute, it's all about the story. Let others get bogged down in the complicated details of complicated issues. We've taken a different path, a better path. Our staff of highly skilled narrative crafters can put aside complexity and zero in on what really matters, a simple tale with good guys and bad guys and a moral that can fit on a bumper sticker. In today's world of information overload, who has time for more? It might be our take on the economic stimulus package, just the latest worse-than-useless Washington boondoggle from a federal government that's completely out of control. Unless, of course, it's a bold and necessary step that finally put the brakes on a financial crisis that was sliding us ever closer to a second Great Depression. We say, absolutely, we produced both of these stories, one tailor-made for Republicans and one equally compelling for Democrats. This is our mission. This is what we do. Or take the war on terror, Another failure of nerve by a wimpy president who puts our country's very survival at risk, hamstringing his generals, apologizing for extremists, and reading terrorists their Miranda rights. Unless, of course, it's a subtle yet aggressive campaign that under this same president's wise and firm leadership has already scored significant victories against those who would do us harm, even as it seeks out new alliances to further enhance our security. Obama as sellout, Obama as savior. Take your pick. We can sell it flat, and we can sell it round. We can even sell it hot or cold. Global warming, for instance, the planet's greatest fraud or greatest peril. Pick the narrative you prefer. Whichever narrative makes the hard thing simple and explains everything you need to know in perfectly partisan, easy-to-swallow sound bites. Healthcare reform, regulating Wall Street, even the meaning of bipartisanship itself. When you control the narrative, you control the conversation. That's our story, and we're sticking to it. Thank you, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.